Welcome to the Backyard Astronomer Podcast, where we talk astronomy, space, and science. From the Rockstar Studios, and brought to you by the Rockstar Group and Manzanita Insurance, I am Adam England, the Backyard Astronomer. Robert, it's good to have you here. Good, good to have you. <laughs> actually, actually, I guess we're not having you, you're having us. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. So I really Welcome appreciate your time. <laughs> yeah, this is amazing. This yeah. is absolutely amazing. I... I wanted to start with, we're, we're the Backyard Astronomer podcast. So not just astronomy, but everything space and science and technology. Where did you get your passion for space? Well, you know, like many, you know, young boys growing up in America, I wanted to be an astronaut. Watching space, space shuttle yeah, missions. Yeah, exactly. I grew up in that era, kind of the end of the, you know, the, after the Apollo, beginning of the, the space shuttle era. And and, uh, you know, of course, that's inspiring to, to a kid. But actually seeing a fireball come down when I was 13 years old is what really set the hook for, you know, the, the, the path in life that I've chosen, uh, you know, chasing space rocks around the world. And you're an Arizona boy. That happened here. Yeah, yeah. That actually happened in Bullhead City. So the, the meteorite actually fell in California. And unfortunately, uh, not enough data to go off of back then to, to ever have a chance of recovering so never it, recovered but, uh, that one. out there somewhere is the rock I saw fall out of the sky when I was 13. And how did that guide your decisions in education and then from there into career path? Yeah. Well, you know, as far as education, there's not really a planetary science course that you can take. It's uh, planetary sciences is kind of a hodgepodge of scientists from other fields that, uh, like me, have an interest for it. I'm one of a couple people full-time that do not have PhDs that, that uh, you know, are, 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 you know, work in planetary science. So it's like a chef. If somebody likes your food, you're a chef. Yeah, it, I guess so. And you're kind of doing it. You're, yeah. you're creating your own. You're, you're making it happen. Yeah, yeah. I've, you know, kind of uh, cho- cho- blazed my own trail in, the, in this particular corner of science. And, uh, you know, that, that path's taken me to every corner of the planet. I've hunted meteorites on every continent except Antarctica. I've recovered over 550 different meteorites around the world. And I think Santa Filomena, Brazil, my last recovery about a year ago was my 25th witness fall, I believe. The differentiation between, you know, having found 550 meteorites, well, those are just meteorites that fell hundreds or thousands of years ago and they're laying in the deserts in the Middle East or Africa or out here in the American Southwest and I just go out and find it and uh, we don't know exactly when it fell but you know we we have it classified uh, scientists one scientist or another around the world will classify it for me and it gets an official number and that's considered a find kind of the bread and butter of what I do is witness falls where you actually see a meteorite fall out of the sky you get there to recover it as quickly as possible while it's still pristine, you get it into the applicable lab that does that kind of research in that particular Or before pipeline. somebody else gets their grubby hands on it. Yeah, or before it, you know, goes down a road that we don't want to see it go down and it doesn't reach science. So it's very important to get there as quickly as possible and preserve the samples. Uh, anytime they're rained on, you know, you start to have uh, aqueous alteration and things that we don't want to happen uh, to the samples. And, you know, preservation is one of my number one goals. Science is certainly the top of the goals uh you know for what for what i do is getting pieces to science getting them in the lab analyzed because uh, you never know what's going to come down next uh then the very next one might be the rosetta stone of meteorites it might explain a process in the early solar system or formation of the earth that we've never seen before something we're not even aware yeah, it of. could be something from another solar system it could which we've never seen it could be a piece of the early earth which we don't think we've seen uh you know back when uh, Thea collided with the proto-Earth and created modern-day Earth and the moon and all that process. Undoubtedly, Which is, like you're saying, still hypothetical you know, because we don't have any physical evidence. Yeah, and, and, and the material's floating around out there. If it happened, the material's out there. So it's just, you never know what that next one's going to bring. It's, I often tell people it's an assayer's guide to the solar system. As we take these first steps out amongst the stars, like... What I'm doing right now may not be as relevant as it will be to those future generations. Stepping out amongst the stars, exploring these asteroids for raw materials. Because basically all the raw materials in the solar system, a good percentage of it is represented in this room. I mean, we have material here from uh, the moon, Mars, different parts of the moon that were never mapped. We have material from Mars, which, you know, we, we have labs on Mars, but we've yet to bring material back. But we can actually say, okay, well, this type of shergatite on Martian surface at the 
the uh, rovers exploring is identical to the sugar type in our collections. Yeah, we have main group asteroid materials, the common chondrites, the irons, uh, the palisites. Uh, we have material from asteroid Vesta sitting here. So you have, you know, you already have samples from all over the solar system. So essentially, the major collections, such as this one, are the uh, you know the uh, assayer's guide to the solar system. Well, now you've got the Curiosity rover is boring samples and storing them to be picked up on later missions and returned back to Earth. Yeah. But you're involved in a recovery return project right now. Yeah, absolutely. They're coming to us all the time. I mean, they're basically miniature space probes that are orbiting our sun all the time. And when they end up on an Earth crossing uh, path and it happens to land on land, uh, you know, instead of in the ocean, uh, got a good, good shot at, at uh, tracking it down. And, you know, a big part of that's the Internet. When I first started, we did everything by hand. It was average recovery for a fireball, uh, you know, for actually finding a meteorite from, from a fireball event was 28 days of triangulation before you ever actually went out and hunted for the stone. Um, a few years ago, there was an event here in Arizona that was actually witnessed by uh, some friends of mine. They called me early morning hours and told me, and I started getting on line and looking at our American Meteor Society website and saw the reports and before um, you know our guys on the east coast of AMS even had a time to put approve the reports and have them consolidated into a map I was manually punching in the data had a solution in the general area it came down I'm looking at the Doppler radar and uh, 16 hours later I was holding a piece of that meteorite in my wow. hand that was a, a new record for a purposeful recovery <laughs> and it's still the record to this day. Now, what was your first recovery? My first recovery? Uh, my, my first collection piece recovery that's actually in the room was uh, at Franconia, Arizona, down by Havasu. I heard here in that, Arizona? Here in Arizona. And there were pieces uh, found from this event that had been classified uh, at one of the institutions here. And, and I learned the location. So I went down there, you know, trying to find more information and uh, spoke with some, some locals who I became very good friends with. And uh, they gave me permission to hunt their property and, and uh, walked out there right as the sun was setting and walked up on about a five pound thumb printed beautiful Franconia. And it was one of the greatest moments of my life, you know, if I'm looking at this, this you know, beautiful museum quality Just meteorite exhilarating. sitting there on the desert floor. It was like perched out on this bench of sandstone, like pre presented. It was, it, was, it was really surreal. And, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to have a truckload of them shortly. And I hunted there two years, uh, three or four days a week for two years, off and on when I wasn't doing other meteorite events. And I never did find a stone as good or as big as that one. Ramen and cowboy it coffee was. and, and you survived, but <laughs> it was it was quite the experience. Now uh, some of them will will come out looking like this one here that's got it's it's burned up from the atmosphere. You have other ones that look completely untouched almost. Yeah. Yeah, well, all meteorites, when, when they hit the ground, they're going to have a, uh, a fusion crust. So basically, most uh, meteors and meteoroids enter the atmosphere at about anywhere from 22 to 31,000 miles an hour. You start reaching levels where there's no, no survivability, no matter how big it is. And those so, are the ones that generally burst into fireballs or uh, yeah, like chelly yeah, binks yeah, well, events. Or, yeah, yeah, chelly chelly binks was you know kind of reaching that upper upper end of the size, but it actually came in in a in a uh, uh, prograde orbit, so it was catching up with Earth. A lot of times they hit head on. You know, it's 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 like a car accident. Yeah, it's like a car accident. Yeah. So uh, anytime they you know they come in prograde opposed to retrograde, there's a lot more survivability. So a lot depends on the orbit and what type of material it's made out of. It's cometary or something. It's, nothing's going to reach the ground. Uh, but you know, most most meteorites, about eighty percent of what falls is what we call common chondrites. So you have your H chondrites, your L chondrites. We have a nice representation here of a. A chondrite that fell in, in the big North, one here yeah in north africa uh, a couple of years ago uh you know you have your iron meteorites like this one this is this is another you know kind of main group asteroid it's the core of a planetary body that didn't make it some minor planet tons of them out there floating around they almost actually, solid iron uh well no just the core uh but yeah you'll typically when the minor planet's destroyed you're going to have your you know the 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 stony portions are probably separated from the, the heaviest the, the nickel iron core. Yeah, yeah, the iron nickel core. So, uh, you know, see, so but you have bits of both. And the palisites, um, contemporary thinking is that the palisites were formed where the iron nickel core uh, met the 
rocky outside of the parent, the, the planetary body and and the silicates kind of leached into the, the, the iron rich core and that's what created the pelicites, the ones you see here with the, the beautiful olivine crystals. Um, you know, they're visually the, the most extraordinary of all the meteorites, very popular uh, just because of their appearance. So those are your common, common, you know, your more common meteorites. Then you have things like this one that's from the asteroid Vesta, which is a which very, we just spent uh, a long uh, the last few years studying. Yeah, NASA yeah. Well, we actually had had a spacecraft orbiting uh, Vesta, so we have a lot of spectral data. We know where some of this material comes from now, where it's ejected from on the surface. A lot of data from Vesta. We have a lot of meteorites in our collection from Vesta, but it's. Pretty much out of the things you can point to in the night sky and say this meteorite came from there, you have Vesta, and then you have, of course, the moon. Uh, everybody can look up and see the moon in the night sky, so that's one of the most identifiable of the planetary bodies. And then this is a, a Martian meteorite, and it's a very extraordinary Martian meteorite that's called a Lurgelite. So it's, it's actually made out of common materials, but in a very uncommon uh, solidification, the way it cooled. It was a deep magmatic flow beneath the surface of Mars. We have lurgelites on Earth too, but uh, chemically different. But, um, you know, we, we didn't realize that, uh, that impacts, great astrobleam forming impacts in ancient times on Mars could uh, excavate to the depth of where the lurgelites are formed until we found one here on Earth. Now, how deep are we talking? You're saying it's a similar process to on Earth, like the lava tubes in Flagstaff. Yeah. You're talking much deeper than that? Much, much deeper. Okay. Yeah, this is this forms far down in Earth's surface and, you know, much uh, very deep in, in Mars' surface as well. But obviously... So a very large some, body had to impact. Yeah, there's been some gigantic impacts on, on Mars in the, uh, you know, early days of its... Uh, uh, formation and and that's how this ended up on an Earth crust. And so that orbit. was probably orbiting for billions of years before. Oh, absolutely. On Earth. Yeah, it's it's been out there orbiting the sun for a long, long time, and that's what's cool. I mean, we we don't know. Next week might be a discovery of a meteorite from Mercury or Venus. And there was a time when we thought having Martian meteorites on Earth was impossible because of the you know the escape velocity of the ejecta calculations were said that it wasn't possible. But here I'm holding them. Mars rock and And the moon's so. much closer, so, so the probability of us having a piece of the moon is probably much higher. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, statistically, moon rock should be one of the most common meteorites on the planet. Yet, uh, you know, I did, I hunted the Middle East for six years, uh, 10 expeditions uh, that I spent over a month over there, and I found a total of four lunar meteorites in all those expeditions. So what you actually find on the ground is extraordinarily rare, uh, but... Numbers-wise, they should be abundant on Earth. I think a lot of it's just is the inability to recognize it. Like here in Arizona, you look at the other side of this this regolith, lunar regolith. I've stepped on a thousand of those while hiking like, and hunting. And exactly, Arizona basalt, very similar. So a lot of it's just the inability to recognize it uh, against the background of terrestrial materials that are very similar. Has that gotten easier with the return of sample missions from the moon that when the, the Apollo astronauts brought stuff back that we could actually measure and see those compositions? Yeah, well, at that point, we were, you know, we were able to... to Confirm the very first lunar found on Earth, Calcalong Creek from Australia. We were able to identify, yes, this is indeed a lunar regolith breccia. Yeah. And, uh, you know, since then, we've been able to actually pair many lunar samples with Apollo samples. Like, we, we know what region of the moon it came from by studying the... You know, the same Mare, samples. this came from yeah. the same region. Yeah, we could see, okay, there's a handful of them. But, uh, you know, they're, they're samples from all over the moon, dark side of the moon and, and, uh, and all over that we haven't been to and we haven't sampled so i think i think you know examining lunar meteorites is important uh because that is our first step as we step out amongst the stars and uh that's where we're going to be getting you know water and raw materials from to to, to you know take the, the steps further colonizing you know mars or you know yeah whether it's whether it's water ice in the, uh, the bottom of a crater yeah. on the moon that doesn't see much light or helium-3. We've got other things that we're talking about. Now they're talking about mining asteroids. Yeah. And we've landed on an asteroid and we're returning a chunk of it. Yeah. How were you involved in that? Yeah. Well, the OSIRIS-REx project actually uh, recovered a meteorite in 2012 called the Sutter's Mill meteorite. And uh, I think it was three days after it fell, I went out to uh, Lotus Park right across the street from Sutter's Mill Park where James Marshall found the first gold nugget that started the California gold rush and changed the history of America forever. Uh, literally could throw a rock and hit 
the mill, the mill head there at the Sutter's Mill site. So two major events in, yeah. in Earth and history I here. Found this meteorite that turned out to be a very rare type of meteorite called a carbonaceous chondrite. And I got the samples into the lab at U of A, and uh, they were just beginning stages of developing the hardware for the Cyrus Rex mission. And, and uh, they wanted to use this meteorite that was very similar, they thought was very similar to the surface of the target asteroid Bennu, and could inje- indeed be an injection paired from Bennu to calibrate the spacecraft payload. So I you know, was able to become a, a part of the SARS-REx mission through that, that contribution and donate, donate material to them. And, and uh, you know, now the, the, I got to go to Kennedy and watch the, the, the launch of the, the mission. Which is and, an event in, it, in and of itself. Oh, that was amazing. That was quite, quite, a, quite a thing to see the, the Atlas rocket launch the, the payload. Uh, then, of course, remotely watch the landing on the asteroid, the sample of several kilos of material. I mean, there's so much material that's coming out, which was like our dream come true. And then now the, uh, the mission's on its way home. The sample return capsule will be landing in the Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah in 2023, and we'll be there watching it. And then you'll actually be able to compare hands-on yeah, with it, the samples that you have exactly. with what they have. And then we'll know if Sutter's Mill's paired, uh, ejection paired from the new. Wow. So it's, it was an amazing opportunity to be a part of real-world science, have contribute in my own little way and, and to be a part of a mission from beginning to end. It's just absolute amazing. And you do that with a lot of your samples. You're, yeah, you're yeah, heavily involved with, with space science, whether yeah. it's at the university level, at NASA, sure. all sorts of programs. Yeah, I'm a volunteer field researcher at Chicago Field Museum. Uh, so I work a lot with, with them, U of A, ASU, uh, University of New Mexico. I was just having uh, dinner with one of their scientists uh, last week. So you know, we, were, we were talking rocks and and all the, the latest, greatest discoveries. So it's, it's exciting. I mean, we're, we're learning so much about the solar system all the time. And every rock's expanding that knowledge. And every once in a while, we hit a whole, real home run like we did with Sutter's Mill, where it just knocks out of the park something totally new, totally extraordinary, broadens our knowledge of science. I mean, it had amino acids in it and sugars that were so primitive, we didn't have a way to analyze them. These are building blocks so of building life. Building blocks of life inside a rock from outer space. So to be able to go out and pick that up, man, that's, a, that's the ultimate adventure in my opinion. Now you said you picked up rocks on every continent except for Antarctica. Yeah. That's the scientist playground. Yeah, they, they all go to, it's <laughs> probably the easiest to, vi- to visually see and discover yeah. them because yeah. they're just laying on top of the white. Yeah. Now you've had others uh, in Michigan. Was a similar setup? Yeah, in Michigan, that was uh, hunting on, on a frozen lake bed. I found the first piece of a fireball that had occurred a couple of days prior. So that was a... And ones in the Middle East that are just laying in sand? Yeah. 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 I worked over in the Middle East for a lot of years, made a lot of recoveries over there, found some amazing meteorites and Great adventures there. And yeah, some of that, not just discovering cool rocks, but you're discovering cultural differences. Yeah, I, I ran into a cultural difference over there one time. <laughs> <laughs> to put it lightly. Uh, yeah, I was actually uh, ca- captured by military patrol and accused of spying. So that was, that was my last expedition to Oman. So Did they let you keep your samples? No, no. no okay. Everything was confiscated, and I was stuck in an eight by eight foot hole in the ground for a couple months and interrogated over a few days. And but it all worked out. You're home. I'm home. Yeah, yeah. I made it, and uh, still doing it. But you know, now how many countries? Something have I you... want to go through again. <laughs> it became quite the international incident. <laughs> how many countries have you visited? Oh man, um, I've kind of lost track. I remember at one thing. point it was 34 or something, but I, I know I'm probably up into the 50s now. So. Um, I, I, yeah, it's been... Um, uh, made personal recoveries on every continent, like I said, every continent except Antarctica. And, uh, you know, North America is kind of a unique situation. We have one of the hot deserts, and we should have more meteorites here than we do in basically the breadbasket of meteorites, which is North Africa, Northwest Africa. But unfortunately, you know, our numbers are, you know, insignificant compared to what they're bringing out over there because every goat herder, every, everybody that's out herding camels or whatever, they're all meteorite hunters. They know what to look for. They know they're worth money. They're coming in here, you know. Very speculative se- now. Yeah, seldom is there somebody out, looking or out walking around the mountains looking for meteorites. We do. Our team. But he, people here, even in Prescott, Arizona, we recently had an event, a recent a year and a yeah. half ago. Yeah. How how can people be a citizen scientist here? 
Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, they're out there and just keeping your eyes open, going, looking, you know, read it, reading the, the materials out there and especially on the Internet, looking at photos and educating yourself on what to look for. Arizona is one of the best places. It's also one of the toughest places because like every day I get pictures of magnetite, hematite, uh, railroad materials, <laughs> you know, like meteor wrongs, as we affectionately call them. <laughs> Uh, like that, that are not meteorites, but they look, you know, they're confusing the public. So educating yourself what to look for and, and uh, you know, yeah, people who make, uh, make new discoveries that contribute to science all the time. And you can do it right here in your own backyard in Arizona. But we should have an abundance of meteorites, but it's, you know, like people not going out there and looking is, is a big part of the problem, is not knowing what to look for. And we just don't, don't have the, the amount of people out uh, roaming the deserts like they do in other parts of the world where you have Bedouins and Berbers that are still nomadic and they're picking them up right and left. But it's just the nature of our society exactly. has prevented that here. It's, that's entirely it. And, you know, recently, about a year and a half ago, we had a big fireball over Arizona. It woke woke uh, woke us up, uh, knocked us out of bed. I got it on my doorbell camera. Did you? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I heard a, you know, gigantic boom and uh, uh, absolutely extraordinary event. You know, I have two career goals left, find a Martian meteorite, amazingly I, I had not done yet with all the hot deserts i've hunted it's very elusive to find a you know martian meteorites are pretty rare but one of these days i'll do that and my second is to actually witness a fireball event and recover a piece of the meteorite from that said event so uh i thought that was going to be it and i plan, still plan on that being it because it's out there we recently analyzed the video from my all sky 7 camera here in granite dells and and uh the the fireball broke up into 19 or 20 large pieces, which would be about the size of your fist, so, a, you know, a pound or two on the, the small end. And, and did uh, they keep burning from there, or yeah, is that yeah, about we, what we, would land? We watched them, you know, in the video, you could see going frame by frame towards the end, it's 19 pieces, 19 or 20 pieces reduced down to 12, and then to 8, 6, 4, 3, and then, like, the last couple just flickered out. So we know there's some larger pieces. Uh, there's probably a strewn field six or eight miles long out there, and there should be hundreds of pieces, but we know there, there are a number of pieces that are definitely big enough to find. And, you know, that's 30, 40 miles west of town here, so or maybe even, you know, 25 miles west of town. This there's, time of year you have deer and elk hunters yeah, out there and absolutely. campers. and Everybody's woodcutters. I mean, there's a lot of people. It's getting cool. People are out. And, you know, you might trip across a black rock that has a fresh fusion Looks crust. Looks like this on the back. But. Yeah, yeah. You have the black fusion crust on the outside burnt fusion crust from entering the atmosphere at 22 or 26,000 miles an hour. And then if it's broken on the inside, do not break it, but <laughs> if it's broken, you will see the, uh, the stony interior of a, of a typical chondrite. You know, you'll have the, typically it's uh, light gray, look, looks almost like broken concrete. There'll be nickel iron flakes, iron nickel flakes inside it. A magnet will most likely be attracted to it. Um, you know, but it could be iron. Uh, there's a small percentage of witness falls that are iron meteorites. Extraordinarily rare, but they happen. Uh, palisites uh, could be an achondrite, could have shiny crust and no metallic attraction whatsoever. But the smooth outside, what we call thumbprints, these little depressions, that's a you know your your sign that it you know there's a highly highly likely chance it is a meteorite, and typically the the interior is going to be lighter. It'll have a lighter matrix on the inside. So, I think no, you could be out there and kind of this know, iron type these. is what a lot of people are familiar with seeing. Yeah. you go to meteor crater. Yeah, you've got a large chunk like that. Yeah, this but is people like aren't your, used to these other types of meteorites. Yeah, this irons are easily identifiable when people think of irons. This you know typically um, this is what they envision. But it's it's actually about six percent of what falls out of the sky. Interesting. I've yet to actually hunt a witness fall iron that's fallen during my time in meteoritics. So I've hunted some historical stuff, but they're so rare. We've yet they, I've had iron falls. We recently had one in Sweden, and you know I wanted to go, but with everything going on, you travel international travel has been greatly limited. So um, it's a very rare thing. But you know uh, maybe the Prescott was an iron fall. We don't know. We don't know. We won't know until we find the it. first rock will know. <laughs> and it could be hundreds of years from now. We don't know. It could. I plan on it being, uh, yeah. Much sooner than that. Much sooner. Any day now. <laughs> now. Now you're married and your wife indulges your hobby. Absolutely. Your, your business, your, your lifestyle. Yeah. You guys go hunting together? Oh, absolutely. When, when the Prescott event happened, you know, we were out there hunting with the kids and, you know, hoping to stumble across that first stone and the whole, the whole, family. The whole family up and became a family event. And it still is today. We're still heading out and, 
you know, doing outings out there. It's, uh, you know, west of the Las Vegas ranch, somewhere out in those mountains, there's fresh meteorites. And we're just hoping one of these days we'll walk across one of those rocks and, and uh, we'll have the, the newest Arizona Witness Fall. There's um, right now, I think, five Witness Falls in Arizona, and I've been directly involved in the recovery of four of them. Our, one of our team members uh, recovered one down in Sierra Vista. Um, the Whetstone Mountain Fall, he found the first piece of that. And uh, we, we mapped that, and it was probably the most well-mapped strewn field in history. So we recently celebrated the, the, uh, you know, that, that event and um, the monograph we created from it, documenting it and the science behind it. So it was really a textbook recovery. And, and you know, looking at what Arizona has to offer, most recently uh, uh, one of my, my hunting partners and I were just out nugget shooting out in the desert and and uh, trying to find my first gold nugget detecting, because ironically, thousands of miles I've walked in Australia, North America, I've never found a, found a, gold, nugget. a gold nugget detecting. Found them panning, never detecting, and and um, we were we were just walking around outside camp, and and I hear him yell and walks over, and he drops this. I'm thinking he has a big gold nugget in his hand. He drops this iron meteorite in my hand. I'm like, oh my gosh! So we get back to the truck, clean it up. I just looked at him with shock in my eye. I go, uh, Todd, you won't believe what this is. And he says, What? And I said, This has been covenite. He's like, what's that? And I said, exactly. I said, it's so <laughs> rare. Most media, I've been learning what even know. is. But this was indeed the second Bencovenite ever, CBA Bencovenite ever discovered in North America, and it was the eighth in the world. And we've yet to find a North American lunar. That's like been the holy grail of all the cold yeah. hunters out looking deserts in Nevada and Arizona and Utah. Everybody wants to find the lunar. I said, you could find 20. I told him, you could find 20 North American lunars before you'd find a Bencovenite. You could probably find 50. It's the ultra rarest of the rare and scientifically valuable meteorite. And we found one out just hanging out one day. Not even looking yeah. for it. Wow. <laughs> exactly. And that was recently. So, you know, it, it, the scientists are going crazy over that one. Amazing discovery. And it was just a couple guys hanging out. I mean, it was, it was remarkable to be there when such an extraordinary discovery happened right in my backyard. Yeah. I've hunted for Ben Covenites in, in the Middle East. I've hunted for them on the East Coast. I've always wanted to find a Ben Covenite. I didn't think it'd and be hanging it out with my buddy in Arizona. <laughs> Looking for gold. It was, it was a real blessing. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> now, you're a member of the American Meteorological Society, Meteorite Society? American Meteor Society. Now, what kind of uh, science education do you guys do with that? Well, AMS is focused on one of our, our primary goals in the field is to deploy a worldwide network of cameras, which we're well on our way to doing. Which you hinted at. Mike Hankey, yes. Um, so, you know, we have, we have quite a few in Europe. I know Germany, UK, uh, we have a number, number of cameras in Europe. Um, Sweden, I believe, uh, captured an actual the Iron Fall I was referring to earlier. Just last night, some of our cameras up in the Pacific Northwest captured uh, that Starlink satellite re-entering. So we have HD video of it all the way across the sky, wow. which is really cool. Precise triangulation of the ground path, things like that. Yeah, Amazing so you're technology. using multiple yeah. cameras yeah. to pinpoint what its location was exactly. as it travels. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, um, the software actually auto-triangulates uh, the event if it's captured on, on multiple cameras. And... You wake up in the morning, you walk downstairs with a cup of coffee, and you can see all the night's fireballs, meteors, fireballs, whatnot. They're auto-captured. If there's more than one station, it can auto try. It's, it's really an amazing system. So can I just it's, get it's one a, for my house? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a ground-changing, uh, you know, game-changing uh, system. So really changes our ground game and the essence of what used to take, uh, like I said, 28 days on average to do. We can do in 28 minutes, have a game, game plan, and be out in the field. And you're linking these together almost like home weather stations to accurately yeah, track this. Exactly. It's, it's plug and play. Uh, Mike Hankey's done an amazing job developing the system. And now we're looking at, you know, uh, there's, there's different organizations that want to use it, whether it be for, you know, uh, weather, forest service, uh, fire mitigation, uh, you know. Uh, or possible looking, satellite reentry. Yeah, yeah. Space junk reentries. Uh, you know, meteorites is my bread and butter, but there's so many organizations out there that have their own, you know, migratory bird. Uh, uh, you know, uh, patterns and things like that. There's a myriad of applications uh, that, that this can, the system can be used for. So our ultimate plan is to have uh, pretty much nationwide coverage, uh, you know, basically just have to have power and internet. And we're actually working on a, on a system that'll be, um, that will work independently off the grid. So once that happens, then we can, you know, get further in the Pacific Northwest and but we've got systems all over South America right now. Uh, 
you know, and I'm wrapping up the uh, north, northern Arizona. We have three systems ready to go up here. And, and is that uh, enough for, for the coverage of northern Arizona, or do you need more? Well, we, we have a lot of cameras in our network down in southern Arizona and Phoenix. I think there's several in Phoenix. And, but it's good to have backup because, you know, you, 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 want, you want multiple angles. And if, if, you know, you have some system error. More data whatever, points. You, yeah, you want to have the redundancy of having multiple cameras. So, no, we encourage anybody that's, that has an interest to, to uh, look into getting an all-sky. Uh, How can they all do sky that? All-sky 7 master cam station. Uh, you can go to American Meteor Society, and the information's on there to you know uh, about the the All Sky Seven system, and uh, you know you can get your order in to have your very own meteor observation station. Citizen and science <laughs> in in real life. Yeah, it's real deed in uh, citizen science. Wow, that's really really neat. This is amazing. <laughs> this, this is absolutely amazing, and you've even got a, a cosmonaut suit over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wow. it's a so-called KV-2 pressure suit. So, so it's, it's taking so, you all so, over yeah. the world, giving you amazing opportunities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been an amazing adventure. Um, you know, you've, you get to see uh, cultures that normally you would never see and so far off the beaten path that nobody would ever think to go there. So I've, I've encountered some pretty amazing things. I've been, you know, up in uh, ancient ruins in the Andes that probably never been explored, uh, you know, by, by anybody that really cares to, to be there. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. There's things you run into, uh, cultures in Africa that, you know, you've never probably ever seen a tourist. I, I seem to be quite the fascination when I showed up. So uh, They love the space cowboy. Yeah, the space, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. So, you know, and I often tell people, uh, you spin the globe and put your finger down. If there's not water there, I might be there in 48 hours. So I always keep bags packed for every environment because you never know. And Passport at hand. Or, yeah, indeed, indeed. And getting it into the lab quickly, uh, you know, it's important. So you, you need to get there. Uh, and, you know, the scientists don't really have the, uh, the time nor the funding to get there. And there's a lot of red tape involved in, a, in a, somebody representing a university or institution going out and doing this sort of thing. So, um, so I'm kind of the go-to guy for getting this kind of stuff done in the scientific world. Just like we're seeing with the privatization of the space industry in yeah, general. exactly. It's more efficient. Yeah. It really is. Wow. Now, you know, I got married five years ago and my wife gave me a meteorite wedding ring. <laughs> so I, I was curious what you think this one might be, or if, is this even one of your meteorites? It could be. It's either Gibeon or Mona Lusta. Uh, I actually have a meteorite wedding ring too. So <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> uh, the, uh, mine's Gibeon. Uh, if that is Mona Lusta, yeah, I very well could have found it. We have a 500-pound Monio sitting behind us here. It's the largest meteorite recovery I've ever made and took us two days to dig down to it and excavate it out of the ground and we had about a 14 foot hole and we got down uh, to, to pull it out. And jewelers and, are just ch champing at the bit to, to get a hold of this. Yeah. 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 And I, you know, I, there was a certain amount of the material after it was cut up and prepped for universities and whatnot. We ended up with some odd pieces that we sold to people in the jewelry industry, which I normally don't do, but you know, there's many, many, many tons of this one and these pieces weren't really acceptable for display. So yeah, it very well could have been one of the pieces. And not as rare as some of the other pieces that yeah, you wouldn't no, do that no, with. Tons, You're not doing that with the lunar or the oh, Martian. Absolutely not. Yeah. A lot of people do, but I certainly won't. <laughs> well, Preservation and, you know, curation for future generations is one of my primary goals. I, I really appreciate your time and what you're doing for, for the advancement of citizen science. This is just absolutely amazing, and it's been a pleasure speaking with you and having you here. Likewise. How Thanks else can people me. help support your organization, your causes? You mentioned the American Meteor Society and the All Sky 7 camera. What else can, can people do to support you or find you? Yeah, well, I think, you know, if, if, you're, if you've, you've done your research and you think you've you found a meteorite, you know, you, you're welcome to reach out to my website, uh, robertwardmeteorites.com. Uh, you know, just send me a photo. You don't have to ask. Just, uh, but you know, do your research. Look at what meteorites look like, and you know, the, not does a magnet stick to it? It's one of the common ones, but there's a lot of rare meteorites that the meteorite, you know, the magnet does not non stick to. So, yeah, do your research, and you know, if it passes the the the, the tests, and uh, you know, send me a photo, and I'm happy to help people out uh, identifying if the rock is indeed a meteorite, especially if it's from uh, about 30 miles west of here. <laughs> And that's at robertwardmeteorites.com? Yes. Perfect. Robert, thank you so much for having us. Well, thank in you. Your it's home, been a pleasure. In your museum. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
You don't have to be a professional astronomer or have fancy equipment to see amazing objects in the night sky. You just have to know where to look. Join us next month to learn more about your binoculars, telescope in the sky, and follow the Northern Arizona Astronomical Consortium at facebook.com slash nazastro. From the Rockstar Studios in Prescott, Arizona, I'm Adam England, the Backyard Astronomer.